Yes, today my name is Deborah Lustig. I'm the academic coordinator of the Center for Ethnographic Research. And uh, Martin Sanchez Kukowski, the chair, asked me to extend his apologies. He has a family emergency, so couldn't be here today. Um, before we begin, I want to announce an upcoming event. Uh, Pedro Rivera, Distinguished Professor of Education at UCLA, will be the keynote speaker at our award ceremony this year. And that's going to be on Tuesday, May 9th. Um, from 3.30 to 5.30 in the Haynes Room of the Faculty Club, and we have some flyers for that out in the hall. I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of our event today, the Center for Race and Gender, the Department of Sociology, and the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. And if you have any devices with you that make noise, could you please turn them off or shut them on in silent? Um, so the format of the event today is that Professor Randalls will speak for around 45 minutes, and then we'll have some new remarks from <coughs> Professor Jill Dorberic, and then a uh, question and answer. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jennifer Randalls, Assistant Professor of Sociology at Cal State Fresno. She has a PhD in Sociology from UC Berkeley, and she was a graduate fellow here at ISSI, mm -hmm. so it's a true pleasure to have her back with us to share her work and her new book. Her research explores how inequalities affect American family life and how policies address family formation trends. Her work appears in edited volumes, journals including Gender and Society and Journal of Policy Analysis and Management, and in her recent book, Proposing Prosperity, Marriage, Education Policy, and Inequality in America. And that will be available for sale and signing after the talk. The title of today's talk is Learning and Legislating Love, Family Inequality, and U.S. Marriage Education Policy. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. First, let me thank you all for coming, especially on this beautiful Friday afternoon after classes have already ended, or they're ending today, right? Yeah. So it's, I understand uh, how one feels during this time of the semester, so thank you for coming in and listening to me. And I have to say, it's, it's a true pleasure and, and privilege uh, and almost surreal to be back in this particular space talking on this particular project. Um, this whole building uh, always felt like a very safe space for me when I was in graduate school and, and, and researching this project. And so uh, I started this in 2007, so it was a decade-long project. The support I received um, from David and Deborah and Christine and three of my dissertation committee members are here, and then I'm getting an opportunity to, to make a new connection with Jill, so thank you. It's, uh, it, it's, it's really powerful in, in a lot of ways. So what I'm going to talk about today, as Deborah mentioned, is it was a three-year ethnographic project that I did on a healthy marriage policy here in the U.S. So let me give you a little bit of background before I jump in to my research about what exactly that is. So money for health, what I'm calling healthy marriage classes, was first set aside through welfare reform that amazingly is over 20 years old now. So last year in August, it turned 20. Um, and this was the policy that, to use Bill Clinton's phrase, was supposed to end welfare as we know it. And the title itself is very telling. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act also a mouthful. Um, and what it, Congress did in the very first part of this piece of legislation, it said that it wanted to promote both work and marriage as, as ways to prevent poverty. And this is why this policy, this is actually not a phrase that I use based on my own ethnographic findings, but this policy, you, you might know it by the phrase <coughs> marriage promotion policy. And a lot of people, without knowing a lot about it, critiqued it outright. Why on earth would Congress go and tell a bunch of poor people, get married as a way of getting out of poverty? A lot of people fear that that's what this policy was going to do. And so I asked what I thought it was a really important empirical question, which is, well, is that, is that actually what's happening? Is that what this money is going towards? So the logic that Congress was using was based on a very strong uh, finding in sociology and various other fields that there's a very strong correlation between poverty and marriage rates. If you're poor in this country, you're only about half as likely to get married and stay married as if you're not poor. The scholars refer to this as the marriage gap. Very strong correlation. So not thinking about the whole correlation causation phenomenon and how they're not the same thing, Congress said, let's actually try to help couples, and this was the mission statement of a policy that followed up on welfare reform. So in 2002, George W. Bush wanted to find a way to create a program, a federal funding stream for money that had been set aside through welfare policy. 
And in that 1996 act, Congress set aside $100 million for marriage promotion activities per year and $50 million annually for promoting responsible fatherhood, which not incidentally is my current ethnographic project that I just spent three years studying. So if you have any questions about that companion policy, I can address that in the Q&A. So this was the mission statement of the policy that came to be known as the Healthy Marriage Initiative to help couples who have chosen marriage for themselves gain greater access to marriage education services on a voluntary basis where they can acquire the skills and knowledge necessary to form and sustain a healthy marriage. So note the language here, who've chosen marriage for themselves on a voluntary basis. And this were very carefully chosen words, right? Trying to make it very much, right? This is not the government trying to force people to get married. And I wanted to know, you know, is, is, that, uh, is that true? What's going on here? So I asked this particular question. So what do healthy marriage classes really reveal about political understandings of how romantic experiences, relationship behaviors, and marital choices are implicated in inequality? So since this did come from a policy that was very much about preventing poverty, getting people off of welfare, reducing reliance on government services, um, I really wanted to know, how are they doing this? How are, they, how are these classes teach about the connection between marriage and relationship skills and class? Kind of what were the sociological implications of this? So like I said, I wanted to know, okay, what's actually going on on the ground here, right? And, and I didn't want to assume, uh, a lot of people really wrote off this policy automatically, right? This is a failure, it's, especially when they start teaching this to, to low-income couples, these classes are going to be um, very dangerous and coercive. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to have both a, a broad way of studying the policy and then also going more in depth. So over three years, with the support of the ISSI, I still call it ISSC, um, I underwent training in uh, 20 government-approved marriage education curricula. I think I may be the, the, the most trained marriage educator in the US. Uh, I don't know what that says about me. So it's about 350 hours of ethnography in these trainings and workshops. And I did systematically choose them. So when I started this project in 2007, the federal government had just put out a list of all of their currently funded nationwide marriage education um, grants. And I looked at the curricula that were in use for all of those 238 programs nationwide. And I created a sample of 20, which included the 10 most commonly used curricula at the time, a curricula that had been approved for the California-based Healthy Marriage Program, and then some that rounded out the sample in terms of a curricula specifically for African-American families, one specifically for step families, and several for low-income families, because I really wanted to get at the class issues here. I also did a textual analysis of over 3,000 pages of curricular materials from these trainings. So that was my effort to really get at the landscape of marriage education, and my talk today is going to focus on, on this aspect. However, what I also wanted to do was go in depth and study one program in particular and really get a good sense again of what these programs were like. And this was actually the focus of, of my dissertation in the book, Brings These Two Analyses Together. So I also studied one program in particular, one that I call Thriving Families. And this was a five-year federally funded program specifically for low-income unmarried couples with children or expectant parents. And I spent 150 hours in those classes. I did 15 interviews with staff and instructors, and then 45 in depth interviews with parents who graduated from the program. So I won't really address a lot of the Friday Families data, but I'll be happy to address that in the Q&A. All right. So much like what inspired my project, uh, wanting to go into the marriage education classroom, that's really what I want to do with this talk. Uh, I want to really highlight some of my ethnographic data from some of these trainings as a way of really showing you what the messages were in these classes and, and how they address those issues of inequality. So before I jump into the ethnographic data, I want to talk about um, one of the ideas that really framed my analysis here. And it's the modern marriage dilemma, which is a phrase that I'm borrowing specifically from Rebecca Davis, who's a historian who wrote about this issue in her history of couples counseling in the US. 
But this is an issue that a lot of sociologists have written about. Uh, if you know the work of Stephanie Kutz, she's talked a lot about this, and, and uh, Andrew Turlin has talked about it a little bit differently. He calls it the deinstitutionalization of marriage. This idea that, that marital norms um, are weakening, and, and it's just it's a lot more up in the air about how people are supposed to make <coughs> marital choices. So what I found was that marriage education, healthy marriage education, was really founded on this tension that modern marriage has dual, almost contradictory roles. Right? So on one hand, it's a very personal, private relationship, right? a basis of personal happiness, right? a way in which we pursue uh, fulfillment, self-actualization. But it's also very much still a, a profound social institution, one that anchors economic independence, right? uh, co-parenting relationships, and certainly still for many sexual <coughs> So what I found was that marriage education programs were really focused much less on marriage, somewhat ironically, right? Um, and really focused much more on love. And it's, I, I talk about this particular kind of love, I coin this, this term skilled love, and I'm going to talk a lot about that today. And what I argue is skilled love is, is helpful for thinking about how these classes were trying to help people reconcile this tension that's at the heart of this modern marriage dilemma. So like Stephanie Coons talks about, right? So it's great in a lot of ways that marriage is now more about personal satisfaction. It's about romantic love. But that's also in many ways socially destabilizing. Because what happens when something like romantic love that can be quite fleeting is the foundation of a social institution that is supposed to anchor all of these, these institutional um, processes and norms. So I think that we can use this to really help us understand what's going on in these classes. And what the classes uh, do, and I'm going to try to convince you of this today, is really teach couples to make significant emotional investments in their relationships as a way of reconciling this tension. To try to be able to learn to love in line with long-term marital commitments, so you can achieve that fulfillment, that long-term happiness, but specifically in a way that supports long-term marital commitment and thereby social stability. And so what I ultimately argue is that the classes were focused much less on promoting marriage and more specifically on promoting a particular way of loving that's presumed to support long-term marital unions. And I'm going to try to tell you why I think that's a really important distinction. And so what I'm going to talk about next is three core logics, if you will, of the skilled love framework. Uh, the first I'm going to talk about how the classes teach that skilled love is very logical. You can learn to, to love in a logical way. Uh, that being skilled in love means that you need certain kinds of romantic competencies. And then third, that you have to exercise emotional control. And so what I'm going to do with each of these is actually provide some snippets of my ethnographic data and again try to take you into the healthy marriage education classroom. Okay. So the first one. <laughs> yes. A little side story. I had this curriculum on my desk when I met my husband for the first time. And he walks into my house the first time he visited me. Did you have a book on your desk entitled How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk? Should I be concerned? And I said, let me tell you about my dissertation. Okay. So to explain this particular logic of the skill love framework, I want to share with you a snippet of a workshop with John Ben Epp who is a counselor and relationship educator who has authored quite a few curricula. Um, so how to avoid falling in love with a jerk, and then he has a set of his, his products are also entitled How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk. Very tellingly titled. Probably my favorite title. So speaking to a packed room of workshop attendees interested in teaching this particular relationship skills curriculum, John Ben Epp proclaimed that he had an effective way to teach the logic of love. He called this the Relationship Attachment Model, or RAM, and he described it, quote, as an empirically derived model of intimacy that teaches people about the five fundamental dynamics of attachment, knowledge, trust, reliance, commitment, and sexual involvement. Love becomes blind and irrational, he explained, when any of these five dynamics get out of sync. He said, using RAM as a template for healthy relationships his program promised that one could learn to, quote, balance the logic of the head with the passion of the heart. And the fundamental premise of Ram is what he called the safe zone rule. And this is the idea that these five 
fundamental relationship dynamics have a specific order and logic. Specifically, he said, sexual involvement with someone should never be, come before or outpace the degree to which you know, trust, rely on, and are committed to that person. As he noted in his book, Outlining Graham, this one I have a slide here, he said, when the safe zone rule is followed, then your relationship grows in healthy and stable ways, and the potential for making a lasting marital choice is maximized. So the take home message here is clear. When people allow lust to overtake logic in their relationship, they risk getting too attached to the wrong person and falling in love with, and worse, marrying a jerk. This is why Van Eck wrote, quote, Research has found that premarital sex is associated with higher divorce rates and infidelity rates in people's future marriages. In quote. Van Epp's message to our audience reflected one of the core principles of relationship science that serves as the empirical basis of marriage education. That healthy relationships have an objective logic, structure, and sequence. And healthy marriage classes, what they do is they really promise to teach couples these universal principles of successful interpersonal relationships as part of what they often refer to as a scientifically based core of relational knowledge. And I should say relationship science, this empirical basis, is a huge and growing field. What's interesting about it is how it does often get translated into, and I saw some of your responses, right, pretty ideologically um, based statements by some of these uh, people teaching these programs. So what Van Eck and many other people that I studied in these classes implied was that there are universal relationship laws, such as the five fundamental dynamics of relationship attachments as described by this particular curriculum. They really operate outside of the context of individual relationships. And the curricular instructors claimed often that because of this, relationship scientists and educators can really identify, measure, and study these laws, and most importantly, for the purposes of these classes, translate them into teachable skills. And that people can then use these to have healthier relationships. And I, I don't think that's something that a lot of people would have a problem with, right? I mean, aside from the premarital sex comment, right? Um, and I'll share with you some additional data. A lot of what's being taught in this class is, is something that I don't think is that controversial. How to be better communicators, right? How to resolve conflict, how to be more empathic. I think it's when it gets translated into these, but this tells you why you should never have premarital sex kind of directives. There were similar lessons that focused on love is very logical. Uh, a very common lesson was teaching people how to learn to differentiate between different types of love. So there's a certain kind of rational love, but there's also infatuation, right? And it was these, these more rational kinds of love that people often use the word real. This is real love, right? Infatuation, lust, those are, those, are not, those are not real love. But if you think about it, right, it was the real love that was often described as the kind that leads to and supports long-term marital commitment. Other curricula focused on things like teaching people how to tap into the calm and rational parts of their brain and how to focus on, on that, say, during relationship conflicts. So the next part of the skill love framework that I want to talk about is this idea of competency and developing particular relationship competencies. So again, as I said a moment ago, there's a lot of work within sociology and other fields about this, this concept of deinstitutionalization. That because marital norms are waning, right, people are at a loss for, well, how do you decide when you should marry someone? How do you decide when you should get out? Is, is falling out of love enough of a reason to, to divorce someone? Well, in the earlier eras, no. Right? But now, right, falling out of love does justify leaving marriages. And so what a lot of these classes, I think, were aimed at, and if you talk to the people who are developing these curricula, is really trying to fill that void left by deinstitutionalization and really providing certain norms of marital interaction. And here's yet another one. So, um, another foundational premise of healthy marriage education is that learning to love skillfully entails deliberately and logically evaluating your feelings and your interpersonal compatibility with others. And what this does, they said, is it allows you to really prioritize autonomy and emotional satisfaction while still allowing you to maintain stable marriages. However, to do this, they said, you have to develop specific relationship competencies namely the ability to regulate your emotions. 
So here I want to share with you an excerpt from um, another curriculum weight training. It's all about me and the me stood for marriage education. This was a, a curriculum that was specifically directed at youth, so intended to be taught in middle schools and high schools. And I will warn you, this is probably one of the more um, disturbing things, I think, and, and I think you'll see why. Um, so it included several lessons on learning how to bond effectively, specifically to ensure a lifelong happy marriage. And the research cited by the curriculum indicated that bonding was more difficult when someone has had multiple premarital sexual partners. So the instructor's manual included detailed instructions on how to illustrate this very important scientific finding to middle and high school students using the tape exercise. So I'm going to share that with you. So an instructor asked a male volunteer to come to the front of the classroom, and the instructor says, quote, pretend that he's going to have sex for the first time in front of us. The volunteer is supposed to roll up his sleeve and wraps a piece of tape around his arm, representing his girlfriend. The instructor asks, quote, class, is it possible for this guy to marry this girl someday? Yes, it's possible, but is it probable? No. So that means that at some point you're going to have to break up with her. So next the instructor tells the volunteer to pull the tape off of his arm. And then the instructor is supposed to say, ooh, class, look at the tape now. What do you see? Our volunteer has left his hair, skin, cologne, even his DNA is on the tape. Yikes. Looks like she's going to need therapy. The instructor repeats the exercise with two or three more male volunteers using the same piece of tape and then explains to the class. Okay, class, what is happening to the bonding power of this tape? That's right, it's losing its power to bond. You need to know that when you have sex before marriage, you are lessening your power to bond to your future mate. You are losing your sexual cement. I'm not telling you that if you've already started having sex, you've lost your ability to bond. I'm also not trying to make you feel guilty. <laughs> you did what you knew, and now you know better. And when you know better, you do better. So again, this idea, and it's not something wrong. You're not making bad choices. It's about knowledge, right? It's about competencies. So I think the take-home message here is pretty clear, right? That if young people develop the behaviors that research has been revealed to be associated with healthy relationships, in this case, very explicitly abstinence prior to marriage. Relational competence can serve as the foundation of a satisfying and lifelong marriage. And the key link between relational knowledge and marital stability is this last component, which is emotional control. Now, the exercise I'm going to show with you here, like I said, I was starting to date my now current husband. I found it incredibly valuable. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you a fair and balanced presentation of the data. I think the exercise I just described, I kind of gauged your reaction. I think very problematic. One, from a, a scientific perspective, right? Um, but this one, the emotional judge exercise from the PEARS curriculum, uh, I actually found quite useful. So, um, so David, who co-taught this particular workshop for the practical application of intimate relationship skills, after three years, you learn all these acronyms by heart. PEARS, they have all these great titles. Um, so, uh, developed by Lori Gordon as the author, David was her teaching partner. So when I attended this workshop, David started off by saying, so what we're going to do first is we're going to teach you how to empty your emotional jug, which is a metaphor for the emotions that rise up inside of us in our daily living. So David, the co-facilitator, he said, we need to tell our partners what's bothering us in a way that, quote, doesn't explode, implode, erode, or corrode tell he's done this before, but instead builds a relationship and creates closeness with our partners, end quote. So the purpose of the emotional jive exercise is to, as David explained, let all of these things go, all of the things that we're holding down that seem inappropriate, anger, rage, fear, sadness. He said, if we have rules that say don't feel sad, don't feel weak, don't feel frightened, don't feel angry because these are bad emotions, we walk around <laughs> like, like neutral automatons, and we build up this great big wall. Okay, this is what David explained. So Lori stepped in and, and elaborated. She said, yeah, when we have emotional walls with the people that we love, right, it can really impede our ability to develop greater intimacy. And so they modeled this emotional jet exercise. Uh, 
David was talking about how irritated he was over politics, though that was in 2009, so a different political situation, um, his boss and his grandson. Uh, and he communicated what was making him angry and scared and sad. And he just said, you know, once I was able to do this, I'm able, quote, to move on to the gladness that pours out of me because we cleared the clouds from the sun and now the sun can shine. So, um, and then this was another quote. He said, when our partner's emoting, we put ourselves in the back burner. We keep a container for that, just like we do when a child is emoting. Right? It isn't about giving any responses and answering. It's just about letting that person explain it. Don't you know? Just letting them talk, just listening and asking for more. And like I said, I found a lot of these very useful. I don't think many of us would have a problem with um, right, empathy, right? True empathy and really teaching people how to listen to one another, whether it's with a romantic partner, or as they talked about, this can be valuable with coworkers, this can be valuable for kids. But again, it was this idea, um, and this was a pretty common theme among these people, of being able to control your emotions. Um, and it was a pretty common uh, technique. So what I want to transition to talking about now is how the skill love paradigm became really important when it came to teaching about inequality in these classes. And I think as a, as a sociologist, this is, this is the part that, that most interested me, and the part uh, of which I think I'm, I'm admittedly most critical for sociological reasons. So without really, in any way, meaningfully acknowledging the role that things like economic deprivation, uh, stress that comes from economic challenges, how those things, and we know, right, take a pretty significant toll on romantic relationships. Uh, and, and researchers explain that marriage gap, so the fact that if you're poor or low income, you're less likely to get and stay married, right, that's one of the ways they explain it, right? If you're worried about how you're gonna pay, you know, do you pay to keep the light bulb on or do you pay for diapers, you don't have as much energy to do things like the emotional jive exercise, right? And bringing that, that energy to things like listening to your partner. And I talk a lot about that issue when I talk about the thriving uh, families uh, case study that I did. However, the classes that I studied didn't tend to explain this issue in that way. They weren't explaining inequality, which I think is very important, right? Given that these classes are indeed funded by, in part, welfare policy and were created at the outset right, with the intent of, of preventing poverty, and that is language from um, that Welfare Reform Act. So what they did, instead of explaining it as a result of things like economic deprivation, as you might guess, they explained it as, the fact that as a matter of lower income couples being less knowledgeable about relationships and less equipped to make good marital choices, good romantic choices. So a primary theme in the classes I study, especially those that, that specifically targeted low-income families, and five of the curricula in my sample were specifically intended for low-income, either individuals, couples, or married couples, unmarried couples, or unmarried couples, is that they struggle both relationally and economically because they, in particular, lack relationship skills. So here I want to share with you some data from the workshop that I attended for the Within My Reach curriculum, which was authored by Marlene Pearson. And this one in particular is uh, from low-income individuals. She explained, quote, your love life is not neutral. There's nothing like a messed up love life to mess up every other part of your life. And by this, Pearson meant that making the right choices about love and marriage is crucial for not only romantic success, but economic success. And in these classes, those two things were very much linked. She said if people only knew how what she called the success sequence worked, they could make deliberate and skilled choices that would keep them out of poverty. Quote, there are three powerful things you can do to get off the poverty track. Finish high school, bottom line. Be married before having a baby. And make sure you wait until you're over 20 to do those things. Do those three things, mothers, and only 7% of those children live in poverty, versus 64% of children whose mothers don't do those three things. So in Pearson's explanation, right, one assumes, one assume that the inability to follow the success sequence, which is you know, finish school, work, and only the marriage, and then only then have a baby. Um, she explicitly said this does not reflect bad family values. Rather, it's a result of inadequate relational knowledge. 
which she and many others said lower income individuals are significantly less likely to have. Another quote from the same workshop. If you look at the unwed childbearing statistics, you'll see that a lack of understanding of the sequence and why marriage matters is really acute among those with the least education and the least economic resources. They're the ones who have the most to lose by not having a good, solid partnership first. Even though marriage may be a goal, the behaviors young people engage in tend to take them away from those goals, and they don't understand that. So I think it's really important to point out a couple things here. Even though marriage may be a goal, if you know anything about um, how certainly in popular discourse, political discourse, and even some of the academic discourse, this is actually directly challenging how a lot of people talk about the family-related choices of, of those who are low income and in poverty, right? That it's a matter of, of values. And here, Pearson is directly challenging that, right? She says marriage is a goal. It's not that they don't want to get married. It's not that they don't have the same mainstream values, right, as middle class people. But it's that, right, they're engaging in certain behaviors that they lack their skills that don't allow them to realize those goals. So she further explained that one's love life is not mutual. This is a phrase she used a lot. Because romantic misunderstandings and missteps can take people off the life course that's dictated by this script, the success sequence. That, she argued, is naturally sequences people for having a middle class life. She said when people don't have a good sense of this script, again, right, so the, the focus on lack of knowledge, right, when people don't understand how education, work, and family are linked, in a logical, ordered, and deliberate framework, they lack a mental schema that orients them towards smart, intentional, and rational life choices. People who don't know the script, she said, quote, drift and stumble, and they don't put time into figuring out how to have a good relationship. So as an ideological framework, right, for thinking about um, how people make family-related choices, that explain a lot of the inequality and poverty that we see, what so many of these instructors taught, either explicitly or implicitly, is that individuals, what they have to do to address these family inequalities is just learn to love more skillfully, right? To be logical, to exercise emotional control, and to just learn these, these universal dynamics of relationships, like the success sequence, that allow people to create and sustain romantic relationships that, and here's the key, function as sound long-term economic investments. So in some ways it was not the most romantic uh, portrayal of relationships, much like we as sociologists do. Um, she, she and others explained that poor people are poor, at least in part, because they lack appropriate emotional controls, regulatory habits, and partner selection criteria. And they justify, not just Pearson, but certainly others, justify this focus on loving skillfully by noting that whereas people have very little control over the external factors of their life, where they're born, their parents, the schools they go to, the jobs that they can get, um, they can control their internal emotional climate and their romantic choices. So it's still a very individualized discourse. And what I want to talk about now is how this message also infused how the curricula taught about financial management skills. So financial management skills was a big part of these classes. So they were required, if they received federal funding, to teach about communication and conflict resolution. But it was recommended, especially for the curricula targeting lower income populations, that they also include teachings on what's called financial literacy. So I want to talk about how that played out on the ground. So teaching couples how to work together as a unified financial team within their economic means, regardless of how meager those means were, was a major goal of healthy marriage classes. And trainers promised, very frequently, that learning to live within a family budget would eliminate many money-related marital problems. So budgeting was a primary financial literacy lesson. So here, I want to share with you, oops, no, I didn't put it on the slide, excuse me, um, an excerpt from another uh, curriculum called Connections, and Connections was also intended for middle and high school students. So this is the mock marriage exercise, and as part of this, couples had to, hypothetical couples had to work on creating a family budget, but before they did that, there were two 
cap, so two bowls, and one had occupation cards in it. So um, secretary, high school teacher, bank teller, factory worker, auto mechanic, professional baseball player, so all different kinds of occupations. And then there was an annual income bowl where the couples, before they came out to do their budgeting, had to pick out how much they hypothetically made in a year. And it ranged from $18,000 to $6 million. Get careful, right? Get careful. So once students selected their cards, they paired off with their mock spouses, and they were supposed to discuss their money values and spending plans, plan an affordable family vacation, and create a family budget that would both allow them to avoid any debt and actually save some. So, not acknowledging at all how 18,000 and 6 million, pretty wide, very good amounts, right? Um, the exercise simply emphasized financial cooperation. So this is a quote from the curriculum. As in real life, the financial capability to complete this exercise will vary from couple to couple. Less emphasis should be placed on the dollar amount of the resources available to the family, and more emphasis placed on using the time together as a way of strengthening their family relationships." End quote. So students were supposed to learn that, right, depending on how relationally skilled they were, how good their budgeting skills were, finances could either be divisive or it could be an opportunity for greater bonding. And the lesson conveyed that whether the family collectively earned 18,000 or 6 million, no couple is immune from money problems, even or especially when couples have different spending styles. Now, I want to say something here about the research on this. It's actually true. So across the class spectrum, couples do say <coughs> money is one of the most common things that couples fight about, whether you're poor or whether you're, you're, you're very wealthy. However, okay, the curriculum didn't stop there. Um, what they emphasized instead was that how couples negotiated financial issues presumably matters more for relationship quality than how much they have to negotiate. As the Connections Manual also explained, when couples disagree about money, quote, the wife, for example, may want new carpeting while the husband may want to take a trip, having a lot of money can be as much of a problem as having to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another curriculum, Marriage Savers, which is a general marriage ed curriculum for um, religious congregations, included a budgeting worksheet where each spouse was supposed to list their short and long-term financial goals and how they planned to work towards accomplishing them together. Again, I don't think this is, this is a goal that many people would have a problem with, right? And a lot of couples cite money as a challenge and negotiating these different uh, values about money and spending styles, but I think this is where it gets problematic. The budget guide in this curriculum indicated that a married couple with an annual household income of $15,000 or less should budget 40% of their income for housing, 15% for food, 4% each for clothing, savings, and health expenses, and 10% for tithing. <laughs> 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 So in 2006, when this curriculum was published, $15,000 would have put this hypothetical couple just above the poverty line of $13,200 for a family of two. So assuming the couple earned $15,000, this meant, according to this budget, they would have paid $960 in taxes. They probably would have gotten that back, right, maybe for the EITC. They would have been expected to tie $1,500. But this budget allocated $418 a month for housing. Let's not hope they live in the Bay Area. <laughs> or even in Fresno, where housing's a lot cheaper. Uh, it budgeted $157 for food, which equaled $2.80 per person per day, and $42 each for clothing, health care, and savings for two people. There was no discussion in this curriculum, or any of the others that I studied, uh, about the difficulties a couple might face trying to budget within these near-poverty means. Uh, the curriculum merely emphasized the importance of budgeting and shared financial goals. And out of the 20 curricula that I studied, one, one, included any information about government assistance programs. 
And of the over 350 hours that I spent in these trainings, two instructors spent a combined 11 minutes talking about providing couples more information about these services. So, like I said, couples across the class spectrum do stop learning as one of their more common topics of disagreement. So the problem, I think, from a sociological perspective, is not that these curricula focus on money. I think that's perfectly reasonable. And something that a lot of the couples I spoke with said they wanted. We want more information about this. But the problem is, that these classes really omitted any of the nuance about how budgeting to eat for less than $3 a day and jointly deciding between getting new carpeting or where to take a trip are two very different kinds of financial challenges. So while the latter situation, very amenable to relationship skills, right, for couples, many people who do take these classes are middle class, um, these same money management skills are not really well suited to helping couples address poverty. So as I wrap up here, I want to leave you with a few con con concluding thoughts about what the implications of political and social implications of my time in these uh, classes meant. So I think what the classes are largely trying to do is really present a rational framework of romance. Um, and I think they're really trying to kind of address this issue of deinstitutionalization to really reconcile this modern marriage dilemma by promoting a type of love that's presumed to um, simultaneously support being very happy individually in your relationships, but a type of love also that supports marital longevity and ultimately social stability. And we know, as many sociologists and others have documented, that more personal freedom in marriage has come at the cost of less marital permanence. And there's no denying that that has created a lot of problems, a lot more family complexity. For example, a lot more children not growing up uh, with, with uh, significant involvement <coughs> from both of their parents. Um, and we, as couples trying to make modern relationships work, marriages or otherwise, right, we do have fewer prescriptive roles that now govern marital behavior in a cultural context where we know divorce rates are very high and love is viewed as the glue of modern marriage. And as Stephanie Kins talks about, like, this is a double-edged sword. I don't think many of us would want to go back to an earlier time where once we got married, and it was never socially acceptable, we were divorced. But like I said, I think we have to recognize what that means we're dealing with now. So I think this is a group of people, right, that are very much trying to address this as a social problem recognizing that people were now expected to make more ongoing emotional investments in our relationship and having to engage, um, and maybe Carla Hackstaff might say, in the marital work that modern relationships uh, now require, right? Um, but I think what's interesting about these programs that I study is that rather than evoking things like personal sacrifice or social obligation or family responsibility, they teach largely about marital commitment in terms of rational personal choice and empathic interpersonal understanding. And in doing so, they're really co-opting these more emotional and romantic impulses of modern understandings of relationships, and I think positively encouraging couples to learn how to uncover and, and more fully experience their emotional desires, albeit in logical, competent, and controlled ways. So I think what this means is, and bear with me here, these classes aren't just about promoting marriage per se, right? Notice the quotes that I read, like the emotional jacket exercise, they don't talk about marriage. And in fact, the Thriving Families class that I studied more in depth, I have an entire chapter in the book that's literally called The Missing Memory, because they just don't use it. So there's not always a focus on marriage. It's actually underplayed in these classes. But what the classes are really trying to do, not explicitly promoting marriage per se, but really shaping individuals' emotional capabilities and ways of thinking about how romantic love leads to long-term marriages in a social context, right, where those social constraints aren't expected to hold them together. And backed by supposedly objective social science, these roles, right, these, these roles for like, marital norms, be empathic, resolve conflict in this particular way, right? They tend to define real romantic love, or what I call skilled love, as only that which precedes, supports, and sustains marriage. 
And consequently, even though they don't talk a lot about marriage itself, by <coughs> teaching about love, real love, skilled love, the kind of ultimate love we should all aspire to and learn how to do, what that ultimately does is it ends up dispar disparaging relationships, sexual experiences, and even feelings that don't serve that. So implicit in the promotion of skilled love as a political strategy for promoting marriage is the directive that lesser forms of attraction and affection must be controlled and subordinated to smarter, more rational ways of loving that ultimately lead to and strengthen marriage. Thus, most of the marriage promotion that happens in healthy marriage classrooms not really about the social and economic benefits of marriage, but rather the psychological benefits of skilled love as a framework for managing the often conflicted emotional experiences of this modern marriage dilemma. So ultimately, by bringing love to the fore in an exceedingly value-laden discourse of healthy marriage that emphasizes how to love smarter, better, and longer, what this kind of, these kind of programs do is they ideologically reinforce the superiority of the two-parent heterosexual married family. But it doesn't do so by teaching that marriage is the best family form, but by teaching that love that's generated and channeled for marriage's sake is the best way in love. And we see analogies in how these programs addressed finances and inequality. So the primary messages about finances taught in these classes was that learning to love skillfully can also help couples avoid economic challenges, including poverty. And trainers described relationship skills as teachable, generalizable, and transferable abilities that apply equally to love and money. Right? Just like you should be logical and competent and controlled to be prosperous in love, they taught that people need to develop these same abilities to prosper financially. And that being both relationally and financially successful depend on the capability to develop knowledge, manage desire, work hard, and forego short-term rewards for greater long-term gains. And like I said before, trainers constantly emphasized how this is not a values problem. They said low-income individuals share the same values regarding marriage. What they presumably lack are the interpersonal skills necessary to put those values into practice. So they ultimately teach that skilled love and marriage helps couples be upwardly mobile, but not, as I would have guessed, because it helps people pull resources and share expenses, but because it provides a conceptual and behavioral framework for responsible relationship and financial choices. So what this approach does is it explains intimate inequalities in terms of disparate understandings and practices of love and assumes that couples prosper when they have the ability to regulate their emotions more effectively. But what it also clearly does is it takes for granted doing this in the context of middle class life chances, including economic opportunity, educational opportunities, and available partners with high earning potential. So without accounting for the effects of economic constraints on personal choices, including romantic ones, the classes and curricula assumed that couples can really improve their economic situation by simply mimicking the choices of middle-class married couples. Yet, as we know, the success sequence is less a recipe for upward mobility than an empirical reflection of inequitable access to jobs and education. But by couching its methods in a seemingly ideologically and morally neutral language of skills rather than family values, Healthy marriage education, for many, seems one step removed from other discourses of cultural deviance and behavioral pathology that are so often used to describe those in poverty in this country. And the focus on skills shifts the discourse that pathologizes single parenthood from one about culture and values to one about knowledge and ability. Explaining economic disadvantage in terms of efficient relational knowledge as almost all of these classes did, conflates skilled love with the ideological values associated with the white, heterosexual, two-parent, married family idea. But what it also ultimately does is it characterizes poverty as an aberration, a direct result of not making middle-class family and financial choices, of sliding the bad relationships, having sex and kids too early outside of marriage, and not budgeting effectively 
rather than as a common outcome of social inequality in a capitalist society. So what I ultimately argue, and discuss a lot more in the book, is that teaching skilled love as a route to upward mobility is based on a limited understanding of what couples need to improve both their relationships and their finances. It erroneously assumes that family inequalities operate primarily through differences in relational knowledge and emotional capacities, while ignoring resources and opportunities. So I'll end by quoting Marlene Pearson and simply say that love lives may not be mutual, but neither are the people. Our respondent, Professor Jill, Jill Dorberic. She's the Zellerbach Family Foundation Professor at the School of Social Welfare here at Berkeley, and she's also co director of the Center for Child and Youth Policy here. Her research focuses on the child welfare system and efforts to improve the experiences of children and families. Do you guys want to come in and sit down? I'm afraid I don't have no Okay. <laughs> Uh, she has written or co-written 10 books on topics related to family poverty, child maltreatment, and child welfare, including maybe her best known as Take Me Home, Protecting America's Children and Families. And she has a new book coming out, uh, The Impossible Imperative Navigating the Competing Principles of Child Welfare, which lays out a framework for conducting principled child welfare practice. So, welcome. institution helps to shape the scholarly pursuits of an individual, getting her PhD here, and some of her advisors are here, and then they go off, and they do great things, and they land a great job, and they're in the academy, and then they take all of that work, and they produce something that is thought-provoking, and inspiring, and engaging, and then they come back and they share with them. So it's just like a jewel for all of us, so we really appreciate that so much. It raised so many thoughts for me about um, the context of this work, particularly in light of welfare reform, and one of the things that I'd love for you to address when, when uh, in, in response is, um, you know, I'm thinking that you, I, I don't know how old you are, I'm going to go into the real deal, but I'm guessing that you were in elementary school when welfare reform passed, right? So for those of us who've been here a while, we remember it as a tremendous day when our world turned upside down in terms of our understanding of federal support for low-income families. For you, you were raised under a welfare reform regime. And so I'd be curious what got you excited about this and, and why you pursued this. But it also raised the question about the, uh, the politics of programs, the politics of studying programs. Because when Bush came in in 2002 and he, and he started his Healthy Families Initiative, I remember many conversations with my colleagues who said, well, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not going to. I see the RFPs coming. I see the study, the research opportunities coming. I see the way that I can fulfill my, you know, my research productivity quotient by getting federal dollars, but I'm out. Because I see the political backdrop of what they're, they are trying to do. I'm not going to play ball. And so I've wondered sometimes whether that stepping out then shapes what you get, right? Because part of what I hear you saying is that there's a great diversity of these programs out there. Some are more thoughtfully put together than others. Um, some may have a, a religious context to them and others don't. Some have a strong ideological values approach and others don't. Um, and it reminded me, it reminded me a lot of um, my sister, who's an elementary school teacher in Southern California, who called me um, a little while back and said, I just wanted to tell you I went to the greatest training today. <laughs> Oh, tell me all about it. She says, well, you kind of do this stuff around poverty, I think. So I learned about poverty today. <laughs> it was so great. I mean, this person came in and she told us all about poor people and how then these kids show up in our classroom and it explains everything. It explains all of their behavior. It explains why they do things. and explains how I now understand why they are so difficult for me and why I need to respond so differently to them. And, and she went on and gave me a lot of detail about the training she participated in. And I, I was sort of stunned and quiet and thought, well, she's a charlatan about. 
she took a bunch of research that is well known, and then she wrapped it in a package with a bow, and she gave you a half a bite of it, but she didn't give you the whole thing. And that's part of, I think, what you're discovering, too, is that there's a lot in this there where the kernel is so true. Yeah, absolutely. And low-income families, is like any, I mean, anybody who goes into marriage wants to figure out how to do it. Do it. Everybody wants to know how to do it right and do it healthfully and happily and for the rest of your lives, theoretically, if you're going to choose marriage as your institution. So, so there's nothing wrong with the kernel of the aspiration. Mm -hmm. But then it's the question of how it gets wrapped up and what the bow looks like. So anyway, I would love for you to address some of those questions around. Um, what do we do about the fact that most <coughs> couples therapy, couple support, is really only available to people who can pay. And then what does that do about our society, create a two-tiered society where some people have access to the opportunities to strengthen an institution that they've chosen, and other people don't have that opportunity. So that's one. Second, if we should create opportunities for low-income families to, um, to strengthen the, an institution that they have selected, then what are the contours of that? And what should the messages be? And the third is, and I see this on the Berkeley campus all the time all the, as well, we have a class that we, we, we offer on financial um, literacy. And uh, prisons offer classes on financial literacy. I've been to many of them now, and they're fascinating. And uh, CalWORKs offices offer classes on financial literacy. So low-income families are live in this vice grip of America where they can't be financially stable, but they're hungry for strategies to figure out how to make the best of a really bad deal. And so what 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 could that look like? So so tell us more about why why welfare reform, why you even cared about welfare reform, how do you even know about it? These issues of politicization yeah. of, of programs and what our, what our responsibility is as researchers to stay in the game. Mm -hmm. um, and then these other issues that you wrote about the you know, diversity of population and do they get access to these things that they want to. So that's, that's my answer. And then, <laughs> then we'll take some questions from everybody. So I'm going to look here so I can monitor the room. Go for it. Well, thank you for that feedback. Uh, these are all questions that I've given a lot of thought to because they come up. Uh, when I give in talks and other aspects of, of my work, um, and also with reviewers. Because as you can imagine, this is a pretty controversial topic. Um, probably one of, I would say, one of the more controversial topics in family studies in, in the last couple of decades. Um, so in terms of why I care, so it's interesting that you mention it. This is actually an outgrowth of one of my undergrad honor species. Mm -hmm. So not quite elementary school, but... Um, <laughs> So it was several years after welfare reform, and I was taking a women in politics class, and I remember our professor got it there, and she said, you know, it's instituting five-year lifetime limits, a lot of people are going to be kicked off of welfare, they're trying to promote work, and she just slipped in as a little throwaway line, surprisingly, that it was women in politics course, and they're trying to promote marriage, and then she went on to something else. I'm like, what? what? Mm -hmm. And one, I was really interested in the question, why would you promote marriage to prevent poverty? It didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's actually made less sense as I've studied the issue. Um, so at the time I was very close to Oklahoma and I was studying the Oklahoma Marriage Initiative and interviewed several people, came to Berkeley, totally did something different than my master's thesis, and then when I was trying to decide on a dissertation topic, I said, this is still biting me. What? Because I was so familiar with the debate, but what I read less about was what was happening on the ground. And I was quite honestly tired of reading about the debate without people having some real knowledge of what, what, what messages were, were being taught in these classes. So that's the why I care. Mm -hmm. In terms of the politicization, oh my gosh, I, could, I feel like I could write. I was just talking to Deborah about this. Um, interestingly, one of the reviewers for the book critiqued it heavily for politicizing the policy. And I had to write a very well thought out memo explaining why as sociologists we start from the assumption that all policies are inherently political, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, I, and I, having talked to a lot of people, the people who ran these programs, and especially the people who ran the Thriving Families program, about how you do have people with very different interests, very different political perspectives, very different reasons for coming together and doing this work. 
And I talked to a lot of people who said, I don't care about the marriage promotion aspect. I want the money so I can, it's still through the Healthy Marriage Fund Insurance. I want the money so I can provide services for these actors that Jill talked about. These kind of services are things that are typically limited to middle class couples, right? Counseling is not cheap. And even government subsidized uh, services are not available to all who are eligible and certainly not all who benefit from them. So it might actually surprise you to know that by the time I get to the conclusion in the book, I'm somewhat of an advocate for these programs. <laughs> and I've been very heavily critiqued for that. Some people think I'm not critical enough and discount my work for that reason, while other people think I'm way too critical. But I think that I personally think, and let me specify, there are a lot of relationship interventions that the government funds, and this is just one set. I should be very clear about that. So I am specifically studying a program and the curricula that were approved for these through that Healthy Marriage Fund industry. It had to have teachings about the benefits of a healthy marriage as part of what they were teaching. But even so, right, like I said before, a lot of people really downplay that message because they didn't want it to be about marriage. So I actually, by the time I get to the end of the book, many years spent studying this and thinking about this and especially talking to the actual low-income couples who took these classes, I came down on the side of, I think this is actually a good use of government money. Right? I talked to the couples and they said, these classes help me immensely. You know, uh, it gives me, I mean, it's not solving all the relationship problems, and they were more critical of the financial literacy aspects. And financial literacy, very broad. Right? Um, I had a lot of couples when I asked, how do you feel about the lessons on money? And let me get up there and teach it. You want me to show you how to budget? I've been living in poverty my whole life. I can stretch $100 so much better than anyone teaching those classes can. But they also benefited from things, and the instructors had a lot of discretion on how they would teach financial literacy. Some instructors, um, one that a lot of couples were really, really receptive to, they asked a room about this size, tell me your most deeply held values. Let's just do one word. Let's just write them on the board. Love, children, family, God. And then let's have a conversation about how your spending habits align or don't align with these values. That couples could get on board with. Not telling them to figure out how to eat for $3 a day or less. So you make a really good point in that how this is being implemented is very diverse. And I would talk to couples, they, they love the communication skills training. Like you said, people want this kind of knowledge. They don't want the marriage stuff. I talk a lot in the book about, there are a lot of reasons couples aren't getting married. The main reason is they say they can't afford it. We're not going to get married until we're more financially stable. And the classes don't really address that, which is why I think a lot of the instructors just said, we're going to drop the marriage message. Because if we walk into a classroom and tell economically struggling couples, or let me tell you all the reasons you should get married. <laughs> and they encountered that enough such that, okay, well, let's focus on what we can focus on. Let's talk about empathy. Let's talk about conflict resolution. Let's talk about the importance of taking time out. But I think even more importantly is when couples explain to me how, for the first time in their life, especially the first time since becoming parents, I was, they would say, I'm sitting in a room with similar, similarly disadvantaged couples. And I can, for the first time in my life, and especially in my relationship, see why we're struggling. It's not me. It's not a personal failing. It's not because me and my partner just don't get each other. There's something about trying to do this in poverty, about trying to make a relationship work and being parents and raising kids when we just don't have that much to work with. And being able to sit with similarly situated couples who also had those experiences allowed them to see, it's not my fault. And breaking up is not going to solve all these problems. This is actually, I, I, the Cowans are here and I read your book, when Partners Become Parents. I saw that reflected in so many of the couple stories that I listened to. And it was because of that that I said, okay, this is, this is actually an important government service. When you have... When you have access to an institution, there's a lot of talk about marital equality. And I know that has a particular connotation. But if you look at marriage rates, it's low-income couples that are not getting married because they feel um, you know, they can't afford it, they're not equipped. So some of the stuff right, that people are talking about are actually drawing from research about low-income couples. 
So I think to be able to give them a collective forum where they can talk about that, and it is about help, you know, giving them uh, relationship strengthening help is really important. So I think that starts to address what should they look like. Um, one thing I would highly recommend is when, and they didn't talk about it a lot, but like Joel said, when you, when you did have instructors talking about marriage, it was a very problematic interpretation of research. The one that I wrote a lot about in the book was this idea of the, um, the, the husband bonus or the marital wage premium for men, which is the idea that if men get married, they earn more, which is true. Married men do earn more. But there are a lot of reasons for that. One being that if you're a higher than man, since it's selected in marriage, right, you're a more attractive marriage partner. But that's not talking any kind of nuance of those. It's just, did you know married men earn more? <laughs> and so if you don't have a sophisticated understanding of correlation causation or you know, science or kind of how to interpret that data, um, bigger problem in society right now, I know. What are people left to think? Oh, they're telling me if I get married, I'm automatically going to, I mean, we know that's not true. So I think, you know, give couples more credit. That's why I teach, I mean, we do, we do this in our classes, right? I do this in my family class. I teach couples, right? But there are, we do see people benefiting from marriage in some ways. And there is some evidence to suggest there's something about marriage itself that is creating these benefits, but not everything. And so I think a much more nuanced discussion of where we see these benefits coming from um, and also more, and some of the classes did this too, recognizing the warning signs of when one shouldn't get married. Um, and no one, let me be very clear about this, it was not coercive, it wasn't get married, get married, and no one, there, there wasn't, I think, as much talk about the signs of abuse in relationships and intimate partner violence as there probably should have been, but there was certainly no, you should get married or you're a bad person, there was none of that. Um, I think I cut it all. Exactly. Okay. Well, I'm sure we get some questions from the yes. other room. Well, I really appreciate your taking the marriage promotion and, and subtracting it from this discussion because it makes people crazy. It does. And uh, people are just irrational, especially on the left, on, on this notion mm -hmm. that we shouldn't be marriage promoting. Yes, we shouldn't. And that really wasn't part. That, that's great. The two, two comments. One is the examples of the curriculum that you gave were mostly uh, religious-based programs, and there were some more science-based curricula. That's just like Cotton's program, and it was yeah. used a lot. Now, what I really want to say is that uh, all of these programs, including that one, emphasize teaching communication skills, and that may not and it wasn't all very effective. True, true. And so what we need to do in programs like this is not only teach about couple relationships, but about parenting, but about dealing with job stress, yeah. uh, about taking things from the families you grew up in and, and, and not. And so teaching communication skills is maybe not the way to go in this field. And it needs to be much broader and more inclusive about couples' lives than most of the programs that, that are out there. I actually completely agree with that. Um, and one of the things I recommended, I, my editor encouraged me at the very end of the book, just imagine you were creating your own program. What are some topics you would include? And I thought, I actually think it would be helpful for couples to know more about the research on how economic stress takes a toll. On, more of an emphasis on the co-parenting. And there were several couples, three actually, my sample, that by the time I had interviewed them, so I observed them, um, recruited them while they were still together, but they, two of them shared a young child, one was, one couple was still expecting their child, and they said, we didn't stay together, but the program helped us learn skills for how to co-parent after a breakup. And I thought, that's a success. And the people running the program, that's a success. And I think you're right, a much broader, so I agree, the communication skills I think is, is an important piece, but I think you're right, from a broader, I would say more sociologically informed perspective of all of the different factors that do shape relationship experiences. And this one is a narrow conceptualization. And also recognize my research was done several years ago. There's been a lot of, of conversations um, with all the evaluations around this about trying to excuse me, focus more on, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very inspiring 
Yeah. Because uh, it's so exotic for me as an Aboriginal scholar to learn. <laughs> but uh, what you talk about is how to get over the poverty trap for children. That's really in the basic. Parents should know to communicate so that the children should know the next generation should make it better. So here we have different welfare regimes, mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. uh, different models, and, and you have another one, we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have an institution also to teach communication, actually. And that is, but that's directed to the children. Oh. How the mothers and fathers should learn how to communicate, to communicate with the babies. Mm -hmm. So you go directly. Huh? It is it is about the public responsibility that, that children will get a good start in that. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. And and then you have this old institution about first beginning with trying trying to avoid malnutrition, mm -hmm. breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. But now it's more and more how to learn how to give love and care for the children. Mm -hmm. And that they do by an institution where where it's monitored. You know, it's health visitors who go home to the families with the newborns and monitor. And give service. But the mothers welcome them because they give service. But at the same time, children cannot choose their parents. So if the health visitor sees that this mother may not be capable to be a good child, then he should take other resources. So I think this really calls for com a comparison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this yeah. Is no, that's no, no, there's, not, there's not a lot of people working on it from a comparative perspective. I was yeah. asked to put together an edited volume on marriage education programs, and I reached out very widely, and there's not a lot of people doing work in different areas, though there have been government funded yeah. programs in, in various parts of the world. But I completely agree. The focus on the parent-child relationship and also the larger focus on the family ecology, right? How the co-parenting relationship affects, uh, right? How it, it, all those relationships interact. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a great huge point. Um, so I, I want to know, uh, I can totally see how these programs would be a good use of government funds, but I want you to, um, to uh, respond to or answer this question. Do you think that this spending on these programs crowds out funding on cash assistance, for example, for um, through TNN? And uh, even if it doesn't, do you think there could possibly be better uses of this money? So if you were a government official and you had $100 million a year, would you spend that money on these classes? Or would you spend that money on something else? If, if the goal is helping for low-income families? That's such a great question. Mm -hmm. um, and one that I invite the reader to think about themselves in the book. So in the very final concluding chapter, what I do is I take the cost of how much it was, it was $11,000 per, per, per couple for the Thriving Families classes. And I broke that down based on the average California monthly cash assistance amount it was like eight months of welfare funding. So they could go through 14 hours of class, right, or eight months of welfare funding. And I kind of leave that open to, so it is, yeah, it's, it's, it's all the overhead. And yeah, it's, some are cheaper, but like nine to 11, it's, it's expensive. Um, and some of this money is going to middle class couples, right? Actually, yeah, significant amount of yeah. Going to middle class couples. So um, it's interesting because when I've written that this money is detracted from TANF program, I get slammed by reviewers. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not. It's not being taken directly away. But when all government spending is in some ways a zero sum game, right? Okay, well maybe it's not being taken directly from that, even though it's all uh, organized by the Office of Family Assistance, the same government entity. Yeah, I mean I think that's something that we have to consider. Right, um, but I, I do. Th I still, it's a hard question to answer. Um, but I still think that there is some value to relationship strengthening programs that help couples understand how poverty is having an impact on their relationship for a variety of reasons. Um, I think I kind of leave it up to the reader because we've had these programs now for 20.
40 years. Funding was just renewed. We're going to continue having them. So I think instead of addressing that particular question in the book, I say if we're going to keep funding them, they need to be better. Right? They need to acknowledge these kinds of issues. Um, so as to the question of are there other areas where the money would be probably well spent? Yes. Is it better? I don't know. But yeah, I mean, the government planning is a zero sum game, and I think the problem is when you, have, especially, I would say, implemented in this way, not necessarily. But I don't think it's a good use of money to be telling people about a very limited understanding of the benefits of marriage and the research. I just um, wanted to know whether in the middle school or high school or even in the couples counseling for adults, married or not, whether the issue of reproductive health and family planning, abortion, um, the right to plan your family, to reduce the stress of nearly spaced children and all of that was allowed to emerge as a way of, despite the abstinence only policy, yeah, yeah. abortion, so forth was allowed to emerge as, as, as something that's on people's minds and they, they should have some control over? The short answer is no. None of that was talked about at all in these classes. I think the reason that it wasn't in a class that I studied most in depth with our families is because their assumption they already have these children, right? They were pregnant and they're you know, kind of working with the, the children they already had, and so how do you actually make the family as it is work? But you no, know, there was no discussion of family planning, you know, thoughts about family size. There was no, I mean, there's only so much they could cover, but no, none of that was addressed. And it's, I think, along with more information about abuse and relationships and things like that, it was one of the critiques. Of, you, know, you can't cover everything in a class, but there's nothing, nothing addressed about that. Carolyn. Well, you do a valiant job, I think, of treading between being overly critical and, and open to what some of these programs can do. And of course, they, as you say, they vary a lot. Yes. What I get concerned about is that even in the stories you're telling, um, it so often gets complicated by the fact that some of us are hearing more politicized messages, and you described how some of the couples, what some of the couples are hearing about poor people or people in poverty. And it reminds me of two things. One, some of those programs have not been very thoroughly assessed and evaluated. So we don't really know the outcomes in great depth mm -hmm. about some of them. Yeah. And secondly, in our intervention work over many, many years, one of the things that's so key is having some um, consultation slash supervision mm -hmm. of the people who are offering these programs so that they don't get tainted with political messages and they do stick more to program fidelity in the best of all worlds. Uh, and most of the programs we see and review uh, don't have that built in. So someone like you comes along with an open mind and an open uh, heart to see what you see. And this is what we're learning, but it makes some of what you're saying, I think, just contributes to people's skepticism about how this money is being spent. And it's, it's not always because the programs aren't working. One, we don't really know for sure. And two, how it's being delivered is not necessarily it's totally consistent with what's on paper. So we still have a long way to go to make these things more systematic um, so that we really know. Um, and two, two points about it, so very important points in that. One, one of the things I talk about in the book is I think we need to ask the question of what does it mean for these programs to work? Does it mean that they're preventing poverty or they're increasing marriage rates? And if those are the metrics we use, well, the answer is no, they're ineffective. But, but, right, if we use different metrics, right, communicate abilities and communication or the ability to co-parent more effectively, right, those are very different metrics. And as Carolyn correctly notes, right, different programs have used different metrics if they've even been evaluated at all. And another point is the training. So people teaching these classes have widely varying professional and academic backgrounds. And the fact that I could, within a year period, get trained in 20 curricula, I think tells you, not, not me, but I think tells you how easy it was to get certification for these programs. So there's really no uh, gatekeeping, if you will. And gatekeeping isn't always a good thing, but I think in this case, right, kind of being like the floor of Scotland's work, who's very knowledgeable about this. And I took the Bringing Baby Home training, and 
there was a little bit, the instructor uh, did talk a little bit more about the research, and I remember the curriculum actually had copies of research articles on Gottman's work, and I thought, okay, this is really valuable. But I think you're right, that research gets wrapped, as it often does, into ideological kind of ways of talking about it that does make it very problematic. You're right, they're widely varied in terms of the, the, tr the, the educational credentials. And, and you mentioned the, the support services. You, know, you had people teaching these classes, so thriving families, they recruited them via Craigslist instructors. And you had to have a two day training, which I took. So I know how extensive the training was. And so, you know, just anybody I remember, and he was a perfectly fine person, but he was 21 years old. And he was a college student at UC Davis, and he's like, I'm going to do this because it fits within my religious ideas, right? I want to help people. And he was smart. He was a psychology student and had more education than a lot of people who taught the classes did. But he went in for his two-day training and, you know, reflecting on his religious views, right? Said, okay, I'm going to, and they taught them, you know, how to gauge your audience. What do people in your class want to know? So I can easily see how someone coming in it with a certain set of ideologies or values, liberal or conservative, anywhere in between, would say, well, they want to know more about this. And in terms of the religious aspects, and I'll never forget, I was studying one program, because you couldn't use this money to support any kind of religious instruction for violation of church and state. And for the most part, they stuck with that, except when they said, OK, uh, it's one o'clock. Mm -hmm. This concludes the secular portion of our training. For those of you who are here for the government-funded portion of our training, thank you very much for your time. Hope you learned something back. And then they spent three hours talking about God mm -hmm. and the devil in your relationship. Yeah. So, you How know, many people left the room? <laughs> Was it like half half? Half? Yeah. Half. Man, I got, I got a lot of people saying, so stay, yay! <laughs> <laughs> They thought the devil was in your detail. <laughs> probably, probably. I think they did think I would. I actually learned later that they thought I was a member of one of those religious watchdog groups for a long time. And I stuck around long enough. Like, I promise. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in other things, um, but not. But they, they stuck to it. You know, they would slip. You know, they would say, God, oh, no, not God. The research. It was interesting how often that they thought in terms of a religious perspective, then they'd go, oh, but the research. It's not, it's not my religious views are compelling to say it's the research. Mm -hmm. The research, as you can see, right, is interpreted very well. So once you get certified, there's no follow up whatever on what you actually do in presenting the program? So had I actually taught them, which took every effort on my part not to do and still maintain access, I did not even have to ask. I think I asked you one time, like, okay, they're starting to ask me to teach the classes. Would this be another good ethnographic opportunity? Or could we decide no? Um, but they were very curious. Why is she? Why is Jennifer getting trained in all of these things? But she's not teaching, and that's really weird. Um, <laughs> there was a little bit of follow back to that, but not really. Because they really told you. They said as long as you. They literally said in the training, so as long as you can read, you can teach. So. One last question. Oh, I don't want to hold people up, but it's, you seem to suggest um, that one of the greatest benefits for the couples was getting into a place where they realized that the other people were having similar yeah. um, experiences. And it seems like that was sort of an unintended consequence of the curriculum. So in response to the question about policy yeah. recommendations, perhaps there's a way to kind of create that more organically, um, to like have the more beneficial part actually lay outside the formal curriculum. Yeah, I agree. And I think a, a lot of the programs did try to do that more by having date nights or times when they could get together. But yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there was just value to getting together and providing the structured collective framework. So that's what couples told me at least. This was so valuable because I heard this other couple talking. That's exactly what we went through. You guys are not the only one that, that are having this exact same argument every day. It's like the stuff that they're precisely yeah. not being taught explicitly about. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting because in many ways it was a very individualized message, individualized discourse of responsibility, but then it ended up people kind of were able to walk away with more of a sociological understanding of how religion, yeah. what affects relationships. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.